welcome to the Creativity Conference's official podcast. My name is Aidan Rode. I am the assistant manager here at the conference. And in this podcast, I'll be discussing all aspects of creativity with some world-class creative minds who we are lucky enough to have joining us as speakers for the conference in Iceland in August 2022. Today, I'm joined by Vashi Nedomansky, who is an incredible feature film editor known for Deadpool, Sharknado 2, as well as an ex-professional hockey player. In 2019, he was inducted into the American Cinema Editors Group and today he's with me now. Vashi, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm excited to talk about uh, creativity and editing. And obviously, like we were talking earlier about the source and roots of that and what else that we're all up to and what else makes us happy and inspires us. So i um, super pumped for it. Yeah, you, you delivered a fantastic presentation, I remember, for the Creativity Conference back in January 2021. How did you find that conference? And did you manage to attend any other sessions? Yeah, actually, I went back after the fact, because obviously, when you're presenting, you're you're just making sure you're focused, you're trying to give the best presentation and pass on that information. But going back and having the access and ability to, to visit all these different um, people and presentations was a blast because, uh, like I said, it, I didn't have time at the moment. But going back, um, I'm always trying to expand like what I know. And I like to learn from people that are <laughs> really good at it and that have their own experiences and can present that. So um, I had a really good time and, you know, I learned a lot. And especially with things like, uh, you know, Unreal Engine and VR and VP and all these different kinds of approaches to filmmaking that we're going to have to encompass not only as editors, but as filmmakers to prepare for. So I was kind of like seeking out those kinds of topics and, and whatnot. Yeah. And there was such a wide, diverse array of people there from choreographers to photographers to Tai Chi and all oh, sorts. Yeah. It was, it was such a great time. And, uh, Going on to what you're up to at the moment, I know you recently just came out with your short film, which was made partially in Unreal 5 called The Seed. Um, yeah. We'll get on to that in a moment. But what are some other creative ende endeavors that you're working on at the moment that make you sort of excited to get out of bed in the morning? Oh, too many. I mean, literally, even though we're still in the pandemic in certain ways in terms of how we're contained to spaces, like for me, that's just a creative uh, you know, Petri dish of, an opportunity for me to just go off and, and chase these things that I don't, don't usually have time for. Um, I'm finishing up a documentary um, called Big Ned about my father, who was the first uh, player to defect from a communist country and play in the National Hockey League. And I've been working on that for about four years you know, in the background because, as, as I'm sure you know, documentaries, A, take forever, are usually self-funded. And the coolest part was embracing um, new technologies that help me up res old footage and old photography and even clean up audio that have been a, a game changer in terms of if I have a, a standard def video of something and I want to make it bigger, if you just upscale it in a program, it looks terrible. But with things like Topaz Labs, I can make things like 4K and it plays and it looks gorgeous. And it's almost like you're rewriting history because it's so clean and clear. So I've been spending a lot of time on that. And I'm also re-recording an album that I uh, wrote like 15 years ago that I had like scratched tabs and scratch versions of, but I'm like, I just got to record this properly because I have the time and I want to. So it's just one of the many creative outlets that I try and find time for during the day. And uh, it usually happens late at night when everyone's quiet and everyone's asleep and, and I get to play. Yeah, that's often the most productive time of the day for, for a lot of people. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And speaking of new technologies um, and Unreal Engine, I was speaking about uh, it with Justin Molman in a podcast episode a few uh, days ago. And he mm -hmm. worked at Epic Games on Unreal behind the scenes. And from your perspective, just how paradigm shifting is Unreal 5 to you for pushing creative ceilings when it comes to not just game design, but filmmaking? Right. Well, I think it's going to, I mean, it's already being not only embraced, but utilized to the point that no one even knows it's being used in terms of how realistic it is and how in invisible and how it meshes with physical production. That's already been proven and that's clear and evident with The Mandalorian and so many other shows that you don't even know about because they're not promoting that yet. So it's already here. It's not going anywhere. But where it is going to go is 
you're going to see it much more in commercials and music videos in short films like mine and anyone else's where you get to play and push it around and see the limitations and see what you can do. What I think the most impressive part of not only Unreal, but all virtual production is that the software is free. The learning curve is steep initially, but if you can hook up with an artist, an Unreal artist or another, you know, kind of virtual production artist that has the skill set, then myself as a director can impart my vision or, or say, here's what I want. Here's the specifics. Here's what the camera should look like. Here's the lens. Here's the, the frame I want. That information is just as important as the technical science behind creating these, these 3D worlds and these virtual characters, because if you just make it and just throw it out there, you're missing the cinematic component. You're missing the practical filmmaking that takes years to learn, which has to be done with your own hands. You can't just pick up a camera and say, I'm a filmmaker without making lots of mistakes and testing out lots of things and, and looking back to the people that influenced you and say, I'd like to do that shot or that style. What are the components of that? And then reverse breaking down that style so you can apply it and then hopefully make it your own or keep little parts and pieces that you did like, but add to it. So I think it, it all goes hand in hand where the technology is there. Um, the cost is not that prohibitive at all. I mean, you do have to have a good computer if you want super real-time playback, but you can do it on a mid-price computer, a mid-powerful computer, and wait for the renders or wait for the playback later. But it is already in places that you wouldn't expect, and you probably don't even know that you're watching it. And I think that's the biggest, uh, the biggest like, not calling card, but that's the biggest testament to, to the functionality and the advancement of that technology, that it's already there and you don't even know it. And one thing that I appreciate about what you're doing is the dissemination of how to use Unreal. You did a, a five-part behind-the-scenes series on how you made the seed and yeah. really went into in-depth about how Unreal worked in, in your workflow. And that was very useful to anybody who's not used Unreal before. So thank you on behalf I, of everybody. No, I, I, no, my sincere pleasure. And thank you for watching it. Yeah, it's almost like 45 minutes. And I just documented the process of, of making the seed. And being a filmmaker who has not gone into virtual production and showing what it entailed on every step along the way from conception to actually designing it, to implementing it, to creating it, to editing it, and then the other components of what makes a cinematic image using Unreal Engine and VP. What was important for me was that I shot all this before we released the film because, um, you know, there's there's maybe a couple of spoilers, but nothing dramatic. But what I wanted to do was show it along the way as we're going, as opposed to here's a film. Now spend 45 minutes looking back and you're like, I already watched a film. I got, I got enough takeaway. So I wanted to preload it with the behind the scenes before you see the film and kind of build up to it. And then uh, because it was a really it was. Um, it took longer than I thought, but it wasn't as hard as I thought because I made a good decision with the artist that I uh, that I uh, paired up with, Azra Alkin, who was in the Unreal Fellowship. So she was fully trained. She was extremely knowledgeable and she's a filmmaker herself. So that communication between two artists of like trying to create something visually that works, that plays and that fits with the other stuff that we shot, that was the only that was the only challenge. And that was, you know, taken care of quite well. And the coolest part was we had 16 Unreal VFX shots in the film, and there's only 85 shots in the entire film that's 10 minutes long. But each shot that we worked on, they got better and faster and easier and more more quicker to the goal of what we were trying to achieve because we had that communication, the skill set was there. And so it was just fun to watch it quickly start to formulate and come together because we were both new to it. You know, and I made sure that the shots in the film started easier and became harder in terms of the the level of technical constraints that were needed to do them. So the first shots were a little easier, a little simpler. They got harder and harder until the last shot in the film that's like 35 seconds long is an actual, it's a one -er. And it's a, it's a camera move that mimics a hundred foot super techno crane. And I made sure that the shot stayed within the constraints of a physical camera. So the move that was planned and created in Unreal Engine um, matched what a physical hundred foot super techno crane that you see on the big sets, same movement and limits. So it only go a hundred feet high and it can only go left to right a certain way. 
what I didn't want to do was create shots in Unreal where the camera's not fixed to anything. You're just flying through space. It looks like a drone, but on another planet. Like that's a whole nother approach. I wanted to have a sense of realism and reality and practicality to Unreal to kind of hide it, to try and hide it even more, especially since the stuff we shot previously was all practical and in camera, that it would just stand out if you're all of a sudden just flying crazy with the camera and having no you know, creative constraints on the vision. So that was another thing we learned that definitely, like if we're talking about takeaways was show some restraint and pull back and trying to be creative and artistic, but within a boundary. So it feels real. That's some Complete. rambling right there, my friend. That is some <laughs> top grade rambling. No, it's very interesting. It completely flipping the time continuum here. Uh, the first film that you said that you ever edited uh, was using some VCR tapes when you were about 12 years old. Yeah. Tell me more about this experience of really getting started in video editing in a very rudimentary sure. way at such a young age. Well, I, yeah, and it's film editing, but it's it was my start and my entry into filmmaking because at that point I was 12 years old and it circles back to my father who was basically was gifted. Um, he was a player in the National Hockey League and he won best player of the game and he was awarded a VHS camera that had a VCR deck in it and it also had a second I also had a second VHS at home so I would be filming things with the camera and then I had the realization that a lot of other editors and filmmakers make it at that time when they're when they have two VHSs they realize they can shoot a whole bunch of footage on one VHS and one camera then transfer it to another VHS by playing play on one and record on the other. And this gave you the option to be able to be non-linear in terms of you can fast forward to any shot you want, record it to the other tape, then rewind. Oh, here's an establishing shot. Let me play that, record that. So going tape to tape deck, you could craft something that was non-linear and you weren't constrained again by just, I shot it, I have no choices but to just remove stuff. So once I realized I could change the order of shots, then I realized I could just shoot whatever I want in any order, knowing that later I can change it, swap it out. And I also learned that with the built-in mic, Jack, you can dub over anything. So if there was dialogue or if there was music I wanted to put in, I could do that. It was only one track of audio, though, so it was kind of hard, but you had to be very specific. But I started seeing behind the curtain and started piecing together naturally the process of storytelling and the process of trying to guide an audience, you know, through a little tale, even if it's a one minute film. The first project I used that for specifically was in high school in English class, we had to do a book report. And I asked my teacher if I could do a short film on the book instead. And the teacher was Mr. Duggan in my school. He was really progressive. He's like, if you can do it, go ahead. So I, I cast my friends. We shot at my house in the backyard. I edited it. I, you know, put music into it. And then I got to show the class this like three minute short film based on the book that we were assigned to read. And I think any artist, um, when you get positive feedback, when you play something in a, in a room or show something to people and they respond in the way that you would like them to, that was the intent of the project, then that's an amazingly reassuring and affirming response that just makes you want to do more and more and more. So when people were laughing in the class and, and you know, having fun with it and understanding it and, and impressed with it, that was a point where I realized like, A, this is fun. B, I'm doing what I want. I'm in control because somewhere inside all creatives are narcissists in the positive way in terms of we want the control. It should be our vision. No one can tell us anything. But the biggest honest truth is. We always ask for opinions. We may not like it at the time, but we always take the advice, think about it, and then implement it because at the end of the day, our name is on it, and I will take help, advice from anyone as long as I have the right to say, no, I'm not going to apply it. So tell me what you think. I want to hear the honest thoughts, and if it can make it better, great. I'm sometimes, you can ask my wife, she'll make great suggestions. I'm like, that's, come on, and then like an hour later, that was the best idea that that really saved the project. So having an open mind, but still having your hand on the wheel are both important. Yeah. And there's a lot of lessons that I, I assume you, oh you took God. from that. And, yes. and speaking of lessons, 
there must also be a lot of crossover from your hockey days, like the analogy of sort of not missing the bus if you don't want to have to pay for everybody's dinner. Are there any other lessons from hockey days that you've yeah. applied to your filmmaking and other creative projects? Definitely. Um, one of the biggest is being part of a team um, and what that entails in both um, in sports, there's a physical contribution, which can equate to being on production on set. Like it's hard work. Anyone who's not been on a film set, it's long hours. If you're a grip or camera or someone else electrical, you're hauling stuff around. It's not easy. The weather conditions can be cold, hot, windy, whatever. It's, it's not easy. Um, so on a team, on a film set team, it matches pretty much a sports team. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a coach, the director, there's a captain, there's role players. Everyone has their job on a hockey team. There's goal scorers and there's fighters, there's grinders. That equates quite comparably to a filmmaking team where you have your actors, your director, you have extras, you have everyone that's on a film set um, and behind the scenes in post-production. They're all there to create that final product as best way possible. But everyone's essential. You take out one of those roles and more often than not, that pyramid will collapse on itself because they were integral. It's not a question of how much you're making or what your title is. Everyone has to be pulling on that rope and going in the same direction. And the last analogy from sports that I found interesting was when someone does something besides their job, if a fighter says, you know what, I want to be a goal scorer now. I'm going to focus on scoring goals and not protect the team and not be a physical element on the ice. And the team suffers because now guys can take advantage of your team. The fighter is now trying to score goals. He doesn't care about his role. He's stepping outside of his role and it hurts the team. Same as a goal scorer who's like, I don't want to, I'm done with goal scoring. I want to, you know, fight. If you want to flip those, that analogy, then he's not helping because he's not scoring. You can't win the game. So on a film set, on production, even in post-production, roles are established for a reason. And until you accomplish your goal, don't try and like overextend and be like, hey, I got some great ideas and you'll be great. You should do this. Take care of yourself first. Then if you have free time, which no one does, then you can start poking around in other um, areas of the production to try and impart your great wisdom, which will be, you know, taken or not taken. But um, there is something to be said of maintaining your role and not staying within your lane, but just being conscious and alert of everyone else's position and job not stepping on toes, but being helpful when you can, but always taking care of your component, your job, your responsibilities first. And I imagine that when you're co-editing a project like you did with Deadpool or Sharknado, I imagine there's you know some creative challenges and uh, disagreements about how a certain thing should look or feel. And how, how do you overcome those? And do you do it in a way that you, a similar way that you would with disagreements over a hockey team yeah um no i think in the hockey world the hardest transition was to uh remove the physical component from my <laughs> interactions with teammates and partners because that's an easy one to fall into and it's you know it has a quick result and there's a winner and a loser uh, but that doesn't apply <laughs> in the movie world yeah. um not if you want to have a long career or or want to work ever again so yes. have, being able to switch over to um, not use the brain more, but be more uh, agreeable and to be more focusing on the end goal. In terms of your question, when you're co-editing something, um, end of the day, the director has a vision. You were hired because you talked to the director. You got along with him or her. You're on the same page. They believe from your past work or from their communication with you that they, you can deliver what they see. So it's not me competing against another editor or another producer or the director. It's me trying to make sure I had absolute clarity with the director or whoever's in charge of the production that their vision, that I'm achieving it, that I'm going in the right way every day, not wasting time, and I'm not fighting with someone else. And more often than not, when co-editors are on a project, they're working on different scenes. They're not working on the same scene. We will share scenes when we're done. We're like, Hey, can you put your eyes on this to make sure I totally didn't mess this up or, or I'm going in the right way, but it's never, there's not enough time to compete with your co-editor. You're both just trying to get through the footage and deliver scenes that work, that play, that um, feel right. 
And then you can always go back and revisit it because the, the, the pace at which today in this world, when you're shooting three cameras or four cameras, when you're looking at or getting 10, 12 hours of footage a day, an editor cannot physically look at every second of footage, even though that's my proponent. Like I, I, on my projects, I make sure I do. Uh, if it's a project like that where you're getting these 10, 12 hours, you can only go with the best takes out of the gate and then go back later. If, if something's not working, you can dig deeper, but you have to budget your time to be able to get through that footage. And both on a co-editing job, uh, you're both just trying to plow through that footage, get a scene in a good place to share it with the director or the producers, and we will bounce it off each other. And I mean, at the end of the day, if if our scenes are working, then as a team, we've accomplished the goal. And if it takes one, two, Oliver Stone would have three editors on. And I know a lot of those editors, you know, three or four editors because he's shooting so much and he wants to see different versions of everything. So being again, it's, it's a team within a team if you're co-editing and you're just trying to stay up to the dailies and stay up to the footage and, and turn over functioning scenes that show the proper intent with as much sparkle and flash of your persona that can help impart it into it. I imagine a, a fairly time consuming part of the editing process is the writing physical notes about what you want to do with it. Um, what is creatively advantageous to spending that time and physically with a pen and paper writing down notes when it comes to post-production? Um, when I take notes, it's usually if possible, like on a second viewing of something, like if I look, I'll cut a scene and I'll have the notes of what was uh, called out for as the best shots or any kind of notes that were important. I'll cut a scene together, then I'll watch it. Then I'll write notes for myself in terms of that's not working. This isn't working. Um, if I watch the whole film later, which at the end of a production, you're watching the entire film like every day, you know, on my last film on six below, I think it was like 27 days in a row. We watched the film every day with the director and then applied notes. And it was like micro moment. Well, first there were bigger chunks that we were moving around. Then it's smaller and smaller and smaller. But you're watching it at that point to see if anything bumps, to see if anything throws you. If you know, And in, in film editing, um, again, it's you know, a lot of people know about it. Some people don't. But it's, it's such a touchy-feely thing where one little moment can ruin a film. Like one cut. And everyone in the audience, if they know anything about filmmaking or not, will be like, what just happened? Is that, I don't understand. I don't understand. And if your audience is saying, I don't understand what happened, you've lost them. So our job is to like basically avoid any bump, any kind of jarring moment in the edit, um, unless it's called for, unless it's needed, unless it's part of the story where you are aggressively telling the audience, look what just happened, right? So that's a that's something separate. But for the main part of it, it's you should keep their attention. You should be able to tell a compelling story in the most concise way that's, you know, enjoyable and agreeable, even if the topic and the subject matter is not agreeable or enjoyable. It's, again, storytelling has many faces and many sides. Some are happy, some are sad, and you never know, you know, I've caught all sorts of different projects, and some are harder than other emotionally, but um, at the end of the day, you are trying to to tell that compelling, concise story that just flows and, and feels like no one's hands have touched it. It just happened. It was just birthed. And that's a rare time, but it is a good feeling. So that's that's my approach to that. And does it change the way that you approach uh, any project, be it editing, be it anything else, about the, the scale of it and the size of the potential audience involved? I mean, case in point, the Pentatonics, a music video that you cut, which has yeah. almost three three hundred million views. Yeah. But do you approach that any differently to any other project, or do you just completely ignore the potential clout involved and approach them the same? Yeah, I try and ignore that because if you, I've I've worked on projects the opposite, where I read this amazing script, I thought it was going to be the best film, um, and then the film, I was actually, I was fired about two months into it because. They hadn't shot, they've shot like 10% of the film and then they fired everyone because they didn't have any footage and they couldn't keep anyone on salary. And the film came out like four years later and it was like vote, like rated one of the worst films ever. And I was so happy I was not on it, but it stung at first. You're like, you're getting fired. You're like, why am I fired? I've done everything I could. You've only shot 15% of it. And then I've cut all the scenes that were there, but it was 
financial. They're like, we're not going to pay anyone, you know, and four years later they finish it. So that was like the other way, like you're like, I took the project because I really thought the script was great, but then the implementation, the shooting, the production was terrible. So you lose out. But I think I approach every project with, I want to work with someone that I either respect or work in a field or a genre or a, a narrative that I haven't done before. Um, I don't like being pigeonholed as an editor. I know a lot of editors are known as, oh, he's an action editor or he's a comedy editor or he's a narrative you know, drama editor. I, I, I don't find that to be true at all. I guarantee you could take any editor that has cut a couple films and they could do any genre at all. If there's questions about like fast cutting or, or these action films, yes, that's a, not an acquired taste, but that's a learning process where that's being usually derived from storyboards or the director's vision that you're trying to keep up to. It's not like an editor says, all right, I'm going to throw 60 shots together and I hope it looks good. There is madness to the process, but there's a method to it. So, um, you know, things from that I've shared, like the center framing, like when you're doing that high energy action footage stuff, super fast cutting, if you keep something in the middle of the frame, every important moment happening shot to shot, then your eye follows it fine. I used uh, Mad Max Fury Road as an example of that, where everything happens in the middle of the frame. So you could cut less than a second on every shot, but it all makes sense because it's all happening in the same part of the screen. So your brain's not working at all. So tricks like that, and approaches like that are pre-planned. So the editor only has to follow the guide roads and follow the map that's laid out before them. So for me, I want to take on projects that I like, work with people that I respect and want to work with further down the road. But I never take it because I'm like, oh, this is going to be a home run. It's going to do this and that. First of all, no one knows anything. We don't know what's going to happen. The Pentatonix video, I cut and color graded that in two days because the director shot it. They needed to release it with the Pentatonix. And funny story with that is I cut it on day one to my liking after about 10 hours. And I didn't know who the, who Pentatonix were. The director reached out and they're like, we're going with Pentatonix. We're shooting a video. Can you cut it? I need, we need it done like three days. It's going to be a lot of footage. I know you can handle it. I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a cool challenge. So let's do that. So I cut it all in one day in 10 hours. Next day I get notes from the director and every member of Pentatonix. They're like, I wasn't on camera when that line was being sung. I didn't know that's someone else being singing. You know, that's this and that and the other thing. I'm like, well, in my head, I'm like, I don't know who was singing anyways. Like I just was trying to match some nice dialogue with this and that, but they obviously a day later, I'm like, Oh, they each have their own voice. They each have their own thing. They each have their own signature, whatever. So then I had to match and go through all the footage and recut it. So everyone who's singing their solo or their important line on was on camera. So it was a complete redo the next day from something that worked. If you didn't know the pentatonics, the second day it was a pentatonics video because everything matched. And then at that point I made a couple of minor tweaks on the third day, then graded it. And then it went out to YouTube and, and that's probably like my most viewed thing. Like if you can count one item, you know, 300 million views is, is nice. Uh, but no one ever knows how quickly some of those things turn around or how fast they have to be done. Yeah. And, and working with people who you, you know, you, you've worked with a lot before or working with someone new, what do you, what is your response generally when people ask you to uh, donate your time or energy to certain projects? Uh, and what, what do you normally respond with? Sure. That's an honest question. And that happens multiple times a week. Um, my approach to working, if you want to call it for free is, I will take on a free project if it's an opportunity to work with someone, again, that I highly respect and I want to have a future relationship with. I will work for free if it's a project that's so compelling and that that fits in my time frame that I want to invest the time in and that I think will either, it has to either introduce me to someone or help me fill a gap in my in my you know, in my world that I don't have filled, that gives me an opportunity that I otherwise wouldn't have. Um, again, it has to be the right timing because there's so many times I've been offered things you have to turn it down because you're either on something else. And I have worked on films where you're overlapping the end of one, the start of the other. And that is so difficult because now you're dealing with two sets of, of not only directors, producers, assistants, sound, music, everything. It's just so overwhelming. It's usually just for a week or two, it trails over. 
and that's something no one should have to go through. It's extremely difficult. But um, for free, it's for free is definitely something that's going to help me. A project that I'm really passionate about that I want to help the project, not just cut it, but make it a visible, aware thing. And also um, to definitely fill in a gap in my skill set or something that I haven't done before. In between feature films, I will often take on smaller projects or cut um, commercials or music videos. Again, it's a different skill set. It's a different approach that I'm not used to. And I like to challenge myself. Like um, this biggest example would be 2020 before the election, our latest uh, United States uh, presidential election. I was approached by Don Winslow to cut all of his online Twitter ads for the election. Um, and Don Winslow is an author and he's an advocate and he's a, you know, American. And, and the, the part with him was everyone was putting out political ads, but his, he paid for everything. He paid for, for me, but he did not accept donations. He did not have, um, anyone you can't donate to him. He's not taking any money. He's like, this is my message. These are my words. This is going out. And I cut 12 ads for him and each one on just on Twitter alone, received at least like four or five million views. And so it was this huge campaign where something would happen in the world. Don would have an idea. He'd write out a script word for word, less than two minutes and 20. So it could fit on Twitter. Then I would have to go find the source material that was referring to what he was talking about from the video clips of anyone involved or the incident that's happening, cut it together, I would do the voiceover myself. So if you look at, if you listen to the Don Winslow ad, it's my VO. I would have to get royalty free music, color grade it, make sure obviously the edit fit with 220. Sometimes the, the script was three and a half minutes. He's like, what well, has to fit in 220? I'm like, A, it's going to be really fast talking, and B, it's like going to be like boom, boom, boom. And we only had two and a half days to do each spot because if something happens in the political world, if you, you have to get something out quickly and now it's normal. Now you go on Twitter, there's everyone's doing political ads, but two years ago, Don Winslow, you know, I feel was someone who made an impact in terms of just putting information and facts in front of people and say, make up your own mind. Like we're just saying, I don't have an agenda besides here's some truth. No one's paying me for this. And here's what I think. And I think it had an impact one way or the other. And that was an amazing process for me for, we did one ad a week. So it was like three months where I was just at the ready and had two and a half days to turn one of these ads around, knowing that it's going to be viewed by 5 million people. And I had you know over 100 million views in three months on these ads, which were, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice number and stuff. But what was more important was testing myself to see, could I do it? You're doing a feature film, you know, you're cutting scenes every day, you get the weekends off. This was something that had to be happened right away, quick turnaround. And there were like 12 rewrites on every ad, every write, oh, we got to drop that word. I don't like that image. We need another track. Like all the normal things that editors deal with, like new music, show me, audition me six more songs, Vashi. So that kind of pace and quickness that I had to work in two days to get this done was a challenge that I wanted to see if I could do. And I I was happy that I could, could do it, you know, because we all question ourselves. We're like comfortable in one spot, but... I wonder if I could do that thing, you know, and you have to test yourself and you have to just put it out there and see sink or swim, you know, you got to see what happens. Yeah. I mean, you've worked on so many projects in your career. Are there any particular ones that you have a bit of a, a soft spot for that you're particularly proud of, but are potentially lesser known about and underappreciated that you potentially wish more people knew about? Sure. Um, I think one that's really important is a documentary that I edited called that, which I love destroys me, um, which is about PTSD. And it was a project that I edited and was one of the cameramen on for Rick Waugh and Rick Waugh is the director of Greenland and um, shot caller and a whole bunch of other films. But um, his father was Fred Waugh, who was the original Spider-Man on the TV shows and stuff. And, and Rick was a stuntman and he grew up as a stuntman, always known as a stuntman. And now he's directed, I think, nine feature films. He did Angel Has Fallen and all the stuff. So he's like an amazing, grinding, hardworking, intelligent, like someone who you peg as one thing and is completely separate and completely different. So when he approached me to travel with him to shoot this documentary, we followed two special um, services 
U.S. troops that were, were going to Iran, Afghanistan during the war, going back and forth, and how hard it is to reclimatize and reacclimatize to normal society when you come back and the the perils that the soldiers have, not only the PTSD, but everything else that goes along with it. And being able to share and get the trust of these two guys for over two years filming them and then editing it to tell their story and having them open up and then making those decisions of what do you share in the edit? What do you share when you're telling that story? What crosses the line and exposes too much? You know, what doesn't say enough? What's just too softball? So that was something I'm super proud of. It was actually shown in, in Washington, D.C. to the Congress, and it's been shown in all the base camps around the world because the goal of it was to, it's okay to be, to know that you're basically fucked up. You are messed up. It, it does happen. And the hardest thing is for these people, for the troops to acknowledge that because it's a sign of weakness when it should be the most powerful thing to, to give yourself the ability to say, I messed up and I need help. And I think that crosses over to mental health issues, drug abuse, whatever. Everything is someone saying and acknowledging it first and the people around them embracing them and saying, we understand and we're going to help you. And when we made this documentary, both characters in the film, both characters, both actual people had ups and downs, huge ups and downs. And the person you thought would be fine wasn't. And the person you thought would never make it does well. So experiencing that in real time and then editing it and and the story kept going on and on like you know there's still chapters beyond the documentary but being part of that story and telling it was super important to me and i was really proud to be given the opportunity to earn the trust of these troops and then be able to tell the story in a respectful com you know, competent and enlightening way so other people could feel and see what they're going through so that's one project big time for sure that which i love destroys me yeah and moving away now to stuff you do outside of your uh, your career what what are some creative outlets that keep you fulfilled creatively that you don't do for work yeah sure no i love i mean sports for sure i have to get out of the house i'll either go hike or play hockey still because i need that sweat that aggression release uh tennis for sure and then guitar like i, I play guitar for like 30 years recorded albums that's my outlet like just put a guitar in my hand and that's my therapy because i can just noodle write songs and i just kind of drift off and it's a release that it's almost like you're hugging the thing you know it's like you embrace the guitar and it gives something back and it takes me out from whatever i'm doing it's 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 my literal therapy for getting something out of me that has to come out but yeah it's part body part soul part mind um but the exercise is super critical for an editor, when you're sitting 10, 12 hours, 14 hours, if you aren't getting up and moving, if you aren't exercising, you're going to have a short career or bad back or or something bad's going to happen in terms of your health and your well-being. And same thing with my wife. She's, she's always like, you're angry. Go for a fucking run or something. Go play hockey. Go play tennis. And then I come back all smiles. I'm like, that was awesome. I feel great. Like, you know, it's you have to be told because creatives, I think, have – uh, a destructive component where we will go until we're literally exhausted and we'll collapse. And that's our day ends when we collapse because we're either chasing something or we're on the dragon's tail and we're close to something. And we want to see if we can catch it or we're in the zone and you never want to mess with the zone. So there's all these things working against us in terms of time of day, um, physical, you know, body, food, drink. Like we forget all that sometimes because we're so close to creatively hitting something or achieving something that we've been just following and so close to. So that's the one thing that I need better at is that the, the work life dichotomy and balance, because if I get on something, I'll just keep plowing because it feels good. It's its own drug. Editing and being in the zone is its own drug for sure. And I think every creative person, if they are capable to get in that zone and lucky enough, to have all the things fall into line so you can get in that place. You don't want to leave it, you know? And so sometimes to a detriment. Totally resonate with that. We're pretty much at time. So uh, I've got one more question for you that I yeah. ask everybody at the end of every episode, a uh, bit of an open ended question, easy to ask, maybe difficult to answer, <laughs> but it's just what does creativity as a creative 
mean to you? Wow, that's an easy question. Um, <laughs> that's, creativity, to me, I'll just... And again, everyone's probably like, oh, these are all loaded questions previously handed over. Nope. Creativity, to me, I think means the opportunity to, to chase my dreams and to create something that hopefully will have a lasting impression, not only for me, but for other people. It's a legacy. And creativity is is that fuel that gives me the jam to go in any direction I want. And it's not just film editing or music or whatever. It's when I play hockey, I want to find creative ways to score a goal, something that hasn't been done before. So it's basically creativity is the fuel that gives me the opportunity and the energy to, to try and chase new things that haven't been done before or perfect something that's already been done or improve upon something that I've started. It's just that something pushing me from behind, keeping me going forward. So that's what I think uh, out of off the top of my head. Very well put. And and with that, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining me, Vash. Dude, my sincere pleasure. Thank you for guiding me through these troubled waters and asking beautiful questions and letting me ramble. I really appreciate it. I, I can't wait to see you in Iceland in August 2022. In Iceland, my friend. <laughs>